Hi everyone, welcome to your lesson on respiratory diseases. All right, so we're going to start an in, by an introduction to some basics of the respiratory system. So um, respiratory disease affect the oxygen carbon dioxide exchange, and that's how it causes problems. And of course, that will disrupt the acid-base balance um, because acid-base balance is dependent on uh, carbon dioxide, but also oxygen. We'll explain that in a little bit. So uh, the passage of air into the respiratory system uh, goes through, you know, uh, so you nose, pharynx, and then trachea, and then the bronchial. Those are all passages for the air to reach the alveoli, okay? And um, all of those areas are going to be lined with mucous membranes that, that um, you know, produce mucus. And uh, the point of that is the, the passageway and the mucus together warms and moisturizes the air so the, the dry air is not like hitting the alveoli. Uh, and so once it hits the alveoli, then that's where gas exchange happens. And um, the alveoli um, are thin, so um, they are lined with epithelial cells that are surrounded by capillaries. And again, capillaries also just have the endothelial cell lining. That's it. So very thin on both, both ends here. And so that facilitates this oxygen crossing over from the alveoli into the capillaries. All the um, passages, the, the air passages, the nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, and bronchial tubes, they're aligned with pseudostratified uh, yeah, columnar epithelial cells um, with gal gallblet cells that produce mucus. So they're, their lining is a lot thicker and, and there's no air exchange going on in, in these areas, just simply conveying the air down to the alveoli. Okay, so uh, the first question to think about then is which acid base imbalance then you think could be caused by this improper oxygen carbon dioxide exchange? Is it respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, alkalosis or all of these? Um, so think about this for a minute, but um, I'll go ahead and explain it. So it's actually all of them. So if you refer back to the acid base chapter, if you have a problem with the carbon dioxide, and you're retaining too much carbon dioxide in the blood and you're not being able to get it out, you're going to get respiratory acidosis, okay? If you're, um, if the patients or somebody's um, hyperventilating, maybe having a panic attack and they're breathing too much, they'll breathe out too much of their carbon dioxide and they'll end up in respiratory alkalosis. Um, so where does the metabolic alkalosis come from? Why, why do we have this one in the mix? Why is this a possibility? Well, it comes from if um, not enough oxygen can reach the tissues, then the cells are going to do anaerobic metabolism to produce ATP. So they're going to try attempt to continue producing ATP without using oxygen. And that's going to lead to the accumulation of lactic acids. And so you'll end up with a lactic acidosis, which is a metabolic acidosis. So lack of oxygen can cause metabolic acidosis, lack of CO2, or non enough CO2 in the blood will cause res respiratory alkalosis, and too much CO2 in the blood will do respiratory acidosis. So there we go. It can get quite complicated. All right, Flick's Law says that um, oxygen and carbon dioxide will diffuse from high to low pressures. So that's what's moving the oxygen and carbon dioxide across membranes in your body. And so uh, as air enters the alveoli, it has a high pressure of oxygen and a low pressure of carbon dioxide. Therefore, the oxygen will uh, is going to be able to cross over into the capillary because the capillary here is bringing unoxygenated blood um, to, to the lungs. And so this blood has a low pressure of oxygen. And so the pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is going to be higher than what's in the blood, and so it will be able to, to uh, offload oxygen. Oxy oxygen will cross over until the pressures on both sides is equal, and then it'll stop crossing over. And then same thing with carbon dioxide. There's going to be more carbon dioxide because it's a waste coming from this deoxygenated blood than there is in the alveoli, and so it's automatically going to cross over until both pressures are um, constant on both sides of the membrane. Um, and so um, the flow rate of oxygen and carbon dioxide will depend on the diffusion constant of the substance. Um, 
the surface area and the pressure difference between the two. So if you have a high pressure of oxygen here, low pressure of oxygen there, a lot more of it will cross over. Um, and the surface area has to do with the alveoli to capillary contact. And we'll see with some of the diseases we're going to look at, you can lose surface area in your alveoli and that loss of surface area causes a problem in the diffusion of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so a little bit on respiratory function. Uh, so tidal breathing and tidal volume. So think of the tides of the ocean kind of coming and going, okay? So tidal breathing is your normal breath in and out, what you do every day without thinking about it. And the tidal volume is the amount of air you normally would breathe in in a normal breath. Not a forced inhalation, not a forced expiration, just a normal breath, okay? So, um, you know, a normal breathing rate would be something like 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Uh, a normal tidal volume for an average adult may be around like 500 milliliters. Uh, and then you have other... Um, other readings you can get. Uh, you can get forced vital capacity and forced expiratory volume. So the forced vital capacity would be how much air you can uh, hold if you really like try to hyperinflate, you know, fill up your lungs as much as possible. Um, a forced expiratory volume would be how much air you can like forcibly breathe out, okay, like empty your lungs. Um, anyway, spirometry, which is done by our respiratory therapist, can measure these mechanical functions of the lungs. So how much air are you able to just breathe in and out in a normal breath? How much can you breathe out completely? How much can you breathe in? And some of, some of these things can give them an indication of what is going on in your lungs. This is especially helpful to assess patients like that have asthma or patients that have COPD. And... Um, so your blood gas analysis, uh, often and again by the respiratory therapist, but sometimes done by the lab techs, um, can measure, um, they measure the results of the mechanical functions of the lungs. So how well you can move air in and out of your lungs then will dictate how much can, or part, partially dictate how much can cross over into the blood. And, and then with a blood gas analysis, you sample arterial blood which uh, has been freshly oxygenated. And so you can see from that how well the lungs are working. Uh, so there are things that can cause hypoventilation uh, and there are things that can cause hyperventilation. Um, and so uh, respiratory acidosis um, can, so hypo, I'm sorry, hypoventilation can lead to respiratory acidosis. So this is, um, not moving enough air in and out. Um, a, a cause, for example, of hypoventilation could be an overdose on, of opioids um, and so, or um, other pain killing medications. And basically it depresses the respiratory center in the brain and you kind of just forget to breathe or forget how to breathe and, and your, your breathing rate, the breathing rate gets uh, de decreased. And so then the carbon dioxide accumulates and you get respiratory acidosis. So, uh, and it's because, you know, your, your respiratory system, your, your breathing is depressed such as you're producing more than you can remove of CO2. Um, other things um, that can cause hypoventilation or the inability to move air is going to be an airway obstruction and uh, emphysema. So airway obstruction would be literally like if, if uh, somebody like you know, sucked some food and went down and lodged into uh, one of the trachea bronchi or something, then all of a sudden you can't move air, so you're choking. Um, and then emphysema um, has to do with a destruction of the surface area of the alveoli, and that can cause hypoventilation because it's, at that point it's actually uh, interfering with the surface area for the gas exchange at the level of the alveoli. Okay. So uh, a patient that gets hyperventilation, which can be caused um, by like pan panic attacks, um, will have respiratory alkalosis because they breathe out too much of the CO2. Uh, but um, mechanical ventilation and critically ill is a common cause of hyperventilation, meaning um, let's say you have a patient that has an overdose of opioids and their respiratory um, system is depressed and they're not breathing enough. And so the, the ER um, or the ER physician intubates them and we start bagging them and breathing and pushing some oxygen in there. Um, 
it what is possible that happens is that we could just kind of overdo we overcompensate um, and give them a little too much uh, and then that pushes them into respiratory alkalosis. Uh, and so then it's uh, where you have to, uh, the resp our respiratory therapists have to find the happy balance of how much oxygen they need, um, you know, how much tidal volume, tidal breathing uh, they have to do for them a system for have, to have the right balance for them. Uh, so here is a little bit on the spirometry just to give you an idea of all the different measurements it can take. So these little uh, ups and downs here represent just your normal quiet breathing. This is a tidal volume, okay? And then uh, if you suck as much air as you can into your lungs, really try to fill them up, that's your inspiratory reserve. So that's this excess air that you can suck into your lungs on top of a normal breath, okay? And then if you try to completely empty out, so after you fill them all the way up, you try to completely empty them out, this is um, what you can push out of your lungs beyond, uh, I would say just beyond normal breath, but not even counting that, this part right here where you can push out is your expiratory reserve. Uh, the residual volume is just um, the volume uh, that will be taken up by like uh, your bronchia, your trachea and all that. It's just the air that's just going to be there even if there's no air moving. Uh, your total lung capacity is going to be all of these added together. And your vital capacity is going to be as much as you can get in with as much as you can get out. That's your vital capacity. This is the maximum amount of air that you can move altogether. So that, again, um, a pulmonary function test uh, done by respiratory therapy can assess this and see um, if a patient has problems getting air in. So that would be, we can assess that with your inspiratory reserve or problems getting air out. Uh, if their tidal volume, the normal breath in and out is decreased, etc. Okay, so let's look at our first uh, abnormality. It's going to be respiratory distress syndrome. It's also known as Highland membrane disease, and this is seen in premature newborns. So this has to do with lung maturity. Uh, and to have good mature lungs, um, the infant needs to have started producing enough surfactant. And this starts um, in uterine as a, as a fetus. Um, and um, the surfactant production begins around somewhere around 32 weeks gestation uh, and reaches full uh, production around 39 uh, weeks. And so usually if a baby is born term at 40 weeks or maybe 39 weeks, we're not so concerned about this problem. Um, <clears throat> any baby born before 32 weeks is automatically going to have premature lungs and somewhere between 32 to 39 weeks, then we need to assess and try to see how much surfactant they're producing and whether or not they're going to need help. So um, if they are not producing enough surfactant, then what's going to happen is once they take their first, they're born and take their first breath, you're going to get alveolar hypoventilation. They're not going to be able to get enough oxygen in and what surfactant does is this little alveoli, the little round alveoli, is, um, once the, the baby takes their first breath, the surfactant allows these guys to inflate and not collapse back down, okay? And uh, so even when you breathe out, they, they deflate a little bit, but they don't collapse. And so they, they, they stay open. And if they don't have enough surfactant, what happens is they breathe in and they breathe out and it collapses and then it can't, it can't open back up because it sticks. The surfactant kind of keeps it from sticking. Um, and so the symptoms of respiratory distress syndrome in a newborn is going to be hypoxia. So we can put little oxygen monitors on their little feet and to see how much oxygen, what oxygen saturation they're getting. Tachypnea, so they'll be breathing fast. Uh, and then they'll be doing this, what called subcostal and intercostal retractions, meaning that they're really putting some effort into breathing. And you can see that withdrawing, like pulling on uh, their ribs, uh, the, the clavicles and stuff like that. You have these, these retractions where you can really see this baby's just really trying to suck air in and they're really struggling. And um, so ideally what we do is fetal lung maternity testing. Again, fetal lung maternity, we're not going to do it before 32 weeks because we, we know before 32 weeks they're going to have immature lungs. Uh, but so the window to do that is usually somewhere in the 32, 38 to 39 weeks. Uh, if they're 39 or 40 weeks, they're usually going to have mature enough lungs. 
Um, usually the sample is connected, collected by amniocentesis, again, so that's a little risk to the baby. Uh, this is where we go and sample amniotic fluid. And um, so we do PG testing, which is phosphatidylglycerol, um, and um, it is not seen in concentration greater than 2 micrograms per mil until the lungs are mature. Um, and so you want to see 2 or 2.2 something uh, level that if you get that there, then the baby's lungs are mature and they're safe to deliver and they should be just fine. Um, you can also do fluorescent polarization tests. Um, the, a fluorescent dye can attach to the surfactant in the albumin. Um, attachment to albumin increases polarization. Attachment to surfactant decreases polarization. And um, if you have a reading greater than 55 milligrams per gram, uh, the lungs are considered mature. If they're less than 39 milligrams per gram, then they're considered immature. So those are two tests that can be done to assess fetal lung maturity. And so these are can be done um, to decide what to do. Now, um, the, the mom can be given some, um, I believe it's uh, cortisone, some shots of uh, hormones, uh, I believe it's cortisol, cortisone, um, to help um, speed up the development of the surfactant in the baby. And of course, we can also give them surfactant after they're born. So we've made progress that way. So um, if uh, the team delivers a, a premature baby, maybe they the deliver a baby that's a 28-weeker, 30-weeker, then automatically they're going to give them surfactant uh, into their lungs because they know they're going to need it. Okay, so moving to acute respiratory distress syndrome, also known as ARDS. Um, and so this can, this is just can be seen in any anyone from children to adults. Uh, it's just uh, separate from the newborn, okay? The causes can be bacteremia, sepsis, massive trans transfusion, near drowning, things that can cause injury to the lungs. Um, and there are two stages to ARDS. The first is the inflammatory phase. And uh, so in that stage, you can see an increase in the permeability of the alveolar capillary um, barrier, which causes an influx of fluid into the alveoli and pulmonary, pulmonary edema. Basically, just think of it this way. So if you injured a tendon or a ligament in a joint, you would expect that joint to start swelling. Uh, the swelling is because of fluid accumulating around that joint, and it's inflammatory. Okay. Well, if the lungs are what's injured, then if you will, your lungs are swelling by causing this influx, the inflammation is causing this influx of fluid, fluid and swelling around the lungs. And uh, the pulmonary edema, there's all that fluid around the lungs, and that's going to interfere with gas exchange, which is what's going to cause the respiratory distress. And then, as they you know stay after the, they they pass the inflammatory stage, then you're going to get the fibroproliferative stage. Um, and in this phase, you have fibroblasts are attempting to repair the area. So fibroblasts is what they do all over our body. Um, and they're the ones you can think of for all your scars that you have on your skin. So they go and in an attempt to repair the tissue, they deposit a lot of collagen. Uh, and in the alveoli, that's going to cause alveolar wall think thickening. But the problem, of course, with collagen deposited scarring in those areas is then those areas are, are, are thickened and they're not functioning like an alveolar wall. So you're not going to get gas exchange at the areas where the scarring is. Um, so uh, the blood gas analysis in ARDS, initially the patient may be in respiratory alkalosis because they may be hyperventilating because of their underlying condition. Uh, but as, there, as the, the, the inflammation increases and the fluid accumulates around the lungs, their ability to properly ventilate is going to decrease and they're going to develop an acidosis. And um, the acidosis that they'll develop will likely be a mixed acid base, uh, a mixed acidosis of respiratory and metabolic acidosis. So um, again, they're not able to properly ventilate to move and, and exchange gases. And so the CO2 is staying behind in the blood causing a respiratory acidosis, but also the oxygen is not able to get in and that's gonna cause a metabolic acidosis with lactic acid accumulation. The uh, treatment for ARDS always uh, revolves around treating what the underlying condition is and giving supportive care. So uh, obviously with bacteremia and sepsis, it's going to be antibiotics in, in treating the infection. 
with massive transfusion is fixing whatever the cause that is requiring the massive transfusion. And near drowning, you're probably just going to have to do supportive care and see how they recover. Other than, obviously, make sure the water is out of their lungs from the drowning. Okay, so again, Annie is an... And Annie, sorry, is an ACU on a ventilator after developing ARDS from acute pancreatitis that developed into sepsis, which acid base imbalance you expect to see. Again, I'll just answer that. So if you want to just rewind that for a second, if you don't remember, uh, you can, so you can answer that question. Okay, so moving on, we're going to talk about another a case. So Mark's case, Mark is 70. Um, year old man, he visits a physician complaining of shortness of breath. He's thin and fatigued. He recently quit his 40 year long smoking habit because he had trouble breathing. His physician orders a CBC electrolytes in an antitrypsin level. So the CBC comes back completely normal. The electrolytes show a sodium 145, a potassium 4.0, chloride 107, and a bicarb of 45. So the bicarb here is a little bit high, as indicated here, and then his antitrypsin level was low at 8 millimoles per liter. So looking at him in this presentation, the fact that he's a smoker, etc., what condition would you think he would have, and then what lab result of these do you think backs that up? So again, thinking out loud, what condition do you think he has? We're fixing to talk about it here in just a second. So you'll think noodle that for a second, and then which one of the lab results you thought backed that up? So uh, these are the ones that were there. Think about it for a second, and we're going to discuss this in just a second. Okay, so ta -da, what he had was COPD. And uh, so that would be the big umbrella uh, term. And a lot of smokers end up with COPD. So COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, causes airflow obstruction, and it's not fully reversible. So the, one of the things with COPD um, in, uh, first is trying to diagnose it as early as possible because um, likely patients won't recover, won't, won't, they won't heal up and get better, but if the earlier you can, you can get it, you can catch up before there's extensive damage, um, the, the longer you can maintain them at where they're at and not allow them to get worse. Um, and so uh, that's usually the best you can hope with for a, C a COPD patient is to um, maintain them to the function they are at without losing function. Uh, so because this is a chronic condition that <clears throat> interferes with airflow, there's some airflow obstruction for we have in interference with gas exchange, um, Many patients won't exhibit acid-base imbalances, as in it, the pH will be normal. But now, some of their uh, parameters on the ABGs are not going to be normal, but their pH will be normal because their body has learned to compensate for this chronic condition. So generally, what you will see with COPD patients are going to be increased levels of PCO2, and that increases the disease as the disease progresses. So uh, the worse the COPD, the higher the, C the, P the partial pressure of CO2 is going to be in the blood gases. This is differentiated, by the way. It's not the same as the total CO2 on the CMP. So we're talking about partial pressure of CO2 on the ABG. So these guys are CO2 retainers. They have too much CO2 staying behind in their blood. And uh, the serum bicarb is also going to be elevated. And this is one of the parameters was in Mark's case is his bicarb was elevated. So why is the bicarb elevated? Well, it's because the PCO2 turns into carbonic acid, which is an acid. How do you neutralize an acid with a base? What's a base? The bicarb's a base. And so the body is basically saying, well, all this acid keeps staying behind, so I'll just keep more base and chronically simply keep more base. And so because the level of CO2 is up, the level of acid is up, and therefore it increases the level of base uh, to the proportion that compensates for that excess level of acid so that the pH stays where it needs to be. So COPD is an umbrella term. It's a group of diseases, and they encompass chronic bronchitis, where there's excess mucus production, emphysema, uh, where there's a loss of surface area due to alveoli destruction. This is the most common in smokers, uh, but there are also uh, people that can get a genetic form of emphysema, we'll talk about here in a minute, and then asthma, which causes bronchoconstriction. 
Okay, so in COPD and chronic bronchitis, what you have is uh, mucus accumulation, and you see the mucus here is uh, is green. So this is infection mucus. It's just there's chronically some infection, and so smokers can also get chronic bronchitis. Um, and some smokers will get a little bit of both. They may get chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And uh, the reason is that smoking paralyze, paralyzes the little cilia that are lining the pseudostratified epithelial cells that are lining these passageways that are supposed to clear the debris and the bacteria and stuff. And so they're not really good at doing their job. So um, infections can set up in mucus and then you have inflammation and all the swelling in mucus and plugs. And you can see how this would be problematic for air to get through and then, uh, so then what you get is you have a hyperinflation of the alveoli, so the air gets in, but it can't get back out. Um, and so that's the first of the COPD. So you can see chronic bronchitis, icky green pussy mucus with um, inflammation of the epithelium and hyperinflation of the alveoli. With uh, emphysema, you don't have all the nasty mucus plug, but what you have is a loss of surface area. So you can see this normal alveoli has nice, pretty, round uh, alveoli. So there's lots of surface area here, lots of round, like think little grapes. And then you look at this little guy, and it just that surface area is kind of lost, and so the capillary bed is lost. And so you, you just don't have gas exchange that is happening the way it should uh, in the normal area, uh, alveoli. So that means not enough air can get in and not enough CO2 can get out. And then with asthma, what you get is smooth muscle constriction around the bronch bronchus and bronchioles here. So that narrows the passageway, making it harder to, for air to get in and you know, air to leave. But it's mostly harder. Asthma patients have a hard time getting air in. Emphysema patients have a hard time getting air out. Uh, they have mucus plugs, but the mucus is usually white. So it's not an infection. Mucus is usually an allergic um, reaction or um, hypersensitivity reaction to an irritant. So, um, you know, anything that they breathe in that they can react to. You also do get hyperinflation of the alveoli, and you get mass cell degranulation and swelling, um, again, smooth muscle constriction and mucus accumulation, uh, but the, again, it's a non-infectious mucus. So um, the lab analytes an assay for COPD. So with chronic alveolar hypoventilation, you will see hypoxia. So they, um, it's very possible for a COPD patient to have a normal oxygen saturation to be in the low 90s, even the upper 80s. And that's just where you, that's what they normally are. They just can't get more in. And at first, they will have normal CO2 levels. Uh, and then they'll, they, if they're just in the chronic phase, they're going to have a normal pH unless something else is going on to aggravate their condition. Uh, and then as the condition progresses and wor worsens, the PCO2 levels are going to increase. Um, and of course, as the PCO2 levels increase, then we, the bicarb levels are going to increase. This is, again, it's renal compensation that results simply in an increased excretion of the carbonic acid from the high PCO2 levels and also an increased reabsorption of the bicarb to compensate for that carbonic acid that's still getting left behind. That will also increase the sodium resorption exchange for hydrogen, hydrogen ions. So this is another way for it to get rid of this excess acidity is to keep the sodium in exchange for the hydrogen ions. So if you, if you can always rewind and go back, if you looked on Mark's case, the sodium was 145. 145 is the top limit of normal. So he's still normal, but he's very close to being high on the sodium. And so, uh, that would then lead to high sodium levels in the blood. So um, we obviously an ABG helps you assess this because you need an ABG to get the partial pressure of CO2 and the bicarb levels and the pH, et cetera. Um, and um, if the patient is a chronic bronchitis patient, then you might want to do some sputum evaluations to see if there's bacteria or infection present. Um, and then, of course, uh, radiographic studies will show physical changes that occur in the lungs due to COPD. Uh, they will develop what we call barrel chest. So it looks like their chest turns into a barrel, increased uh, 
surface area look like they always just like have this deep breath and their chest kind of pokes out, etc. Uh, and then uh, you can also do an alpha-1 antitrypsin um, to rule out um, the genetic alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So this right here we need to stop and talk about for a second. So um, alpha-1 antitrypsin um, is made by the lungs to neutralize um, the effects of leukocyte esterase, which your white cells produce when they fight off bacteria. And it's really good to kill the bacteria, but it can also destroy the, the healthy lung tissue. And so normally the body simply produces alpha-1 antitrypsin, and that neutralizes those negative effects of the presence of white cells fighting off infection. If a patient does not have enough alpha-1 antitrypsin, every time they have an infection in the lungs, the leukocyte esterase is going to cause damage to the lungs and there won't be any alpha-1 antitrypsin to neutralize it and it's going to cause, start causing scarring and problems in the lung. And, um, and so they can actually develop emphysema due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency even if they've never picked up a cigarette in their entire life. Um, so again, just to be compassionate towards people, just don't assume if they have COPD or emphysema, that they were automatically a smoker. There are some people out there that would have it just from a genetic cause. Um, and then our respiratory department can do pulmonary function tests to assess uh, the breathing patterns and uh, to see if they have problems getting air in or getting air out and what's going on with them. So next little question, so which one of these COPDs can be from an inherited deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin? So hopefully you were paying attention. You can answer that. And then moving on, we're going to talk about cystic fibrosis. So um, it is an autosomal recessive genetic disease, so it's inherited. And the hallmark of it is abnormal mucus secretions. And the mucus is really thick and sticky and it's very hard for your body to clear it. Okay. Uh, this is the genetic deficiency is in the uh, uh, chloride ion transport channel and so you get an abnormal transport of chloride ion within the cells with a decreased secretion of chloride and an increased reabsorption of sodium in water across these epithelial cells um, and so it's basically really difficult for it to get enough water in the mucus um, for the patients to clear the mucus. So this is a a trick not for cystic fibrosis specifically, but for your regular patient, if you don't have cystic fibrosis, a uh, regular person, um, if you have any kind of condition that's causing mucus, like a sinusitis, a bronchitis, or anything like that, then uh, um, physicians always recommend good hydration, loss of hydration, because what hydration does, having plenty of water in your body, it allows you to more uh, clear your mucus and make more uh, liquidy mucus, not sticky mucus, so you can get it out and you, your body can heal. All right, and so these patients don't have the ability to do that because of this genetic defect. And so um, the mucus in the lungs, so you have that decreased hydration of the mucus, so sticky mucus, uh, and it makes it thick, sticky, and it sticks to bacteria, and it sticks to the trachea and the bronchia, and um, so uh, that causes an increase, it traps those bacteria and it causes an increased infection and inflammation because it just, normally you would cough it up and get it out. And so, for example, one of the therapies that can be done with cystic fibrosis patient is put this vest on and just vibrates and beats on their chest like, like that. And uh, it like vibrates the mucus loose where they can cough it up and get it out. Um, uh, mucus accumulation can also occur in the GI system and cause pancreatic problems, so they can have problems with digestive enzymes and uh, digesting their food and often have to have digestive enzymes given for that. The lab procedures, the sweat test used to be the standard test, but now we've pretty much moved to genetic testing as part of prenatal care and newborn care to uh, diagnose it early on so it can be managed uh, from, from birth on out. So next we have pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia is simply an infection in the lungs. Pneumonia can be deadly though. Um, causative agents can be bacteria or viruses. Um, that's the most common, although you can get fungal pneumonias. And um, it is um, not unusual for patients to get bacterial pneumonia secondary to a viral pneumonia or um, a flu or something like that. So you get, you get um, patients get the flu and then they can end up with uh, bacterial pneumonia and this is um, self-infected uh, usually with strep pneumo and uh, so those are the two you know 
main scenarios you'll see patients with pneumonia. Risk factors for pneumonia are increased age, being immunocompromised, so any um, patients on um, drugs that compromise the immune system, such as autoimmune drugs, um, chemotherapy, etc. Um, they, uh, if they have an underlying lung disease, or so COPD, so again, this is where you could have an aggravation of their COPD if they have pneumonia on top of their COPD. Uh, smoker, of course, for the same reason uh, we were talking about with chronic bronchitis, uh, patients that are intubated are at a higher risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia, etc. A uh, lab procedure to diagnose pneumonia are going to be uh, gram stain and sputum cultures on sputum, obviously. Uh, PCR testing can be done. Um, it can be sputum or nasopharyngeal, so you have to see what the recommendations are, and I'm going to talk about that here in just a second. And other than that, physicians will do at least a CBC, CMP, and ABG. Um, the CBC, obviously, to see uh, help distinguish between bacterial and viral infections, and then ABGs to see how the gas exchange is going, uh, and then they, not a lab procedure, but obviously they're going to do a chest x-ray, and they would see, normally you want to see nice clear lungs like this, nice dark black, uh, but here you can see in this lobe, there's some consolidations and stuff, so there is, this is an indication that this right here is an area of patch of pneumonia in uh, the lungs there. So I do want to, this is the PCR one. So this is the Biofire Film Array, their panel. I just wanted to show you what is possible. This is the thing that's really cool. So you can do um, all of this. This is their new Respiratory 2.1 panel. And in one test, you can test for all of these viruses, including uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, coronavirus, adenovirus, influ all the influenzas, um, the rhinovirus, enterovirus, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, parainfluenza virus, and then these bacteria too, Bordetella, uh, Chlamydia, Pneumoniae, and Mycoplasma Pneumoniae. So all of these can be done with one test. Um, the sample here is a nasopharyngeal swab in the proper transport media. So pretty cool, we can get all of this, it takes less than an hour. The other one they have is a pneumonia uh, one, and uh, so this is sputum or bronchial um, alveolar lavage, which is where they're just actually just intubate them, kind of put water in it and suck it back up, well, lavage, I don't know if it's water, maybe saline. Anyway, they kind of wash their lungs and suck it, the stuff to jump back up, and that can be tested. And so these guys, this panel can um, test for some of these viruses that we've already mentioned, RSV, but also they can test uh, antimicrobial resistance genes, so see if the, uh, hopefully the patient doesn't have it, like um, a staph aureus does uh, MRSA, uh, so uh, they can check all of this, and then in the bacteria, they can check for Acinobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Serratia, and the different staph and streps. Uh, and some of the atypical bacteria like Chlamydia, Legionella, and Mycoplasma. So all it is in one panel for one, with you know, one sample in an hour or less. So pretty cool. Uh, and I'm going to skip that one. So um, that one's a little bit, if I'll, I'll play it. I'll, I'll link it below. It's just a little bit about the Biofire respiratory panel. Um, so pulmonary edema is our next condition. The, um, you, with pulmonary edema, you have fluid buildup around the alveoli. Fluid interferes with gas exchange, so this is a problem. Most cases of pulmonary edema have a cardiac cause, and it's caused often by congestive heart failure, but it can also be caused by an acute MI or other cardiomyopathies. Um, so again, we've talked about this in the, in the heart chapter, um, heart disease, you can also refer back to that, but basically, if the heart as a pump is being inefficient, it's going to not be able to return all the fluids back and fluids going to be left behind in the tissues, including around the lungs and you get pulmonary edema. Other causes of pul pulmonary edema, uh, edema is going to be decreased plasma oncotic pressure, predominantly from low albumin. Low albumin can be obviously from lack of production in the liver because of liver disease, cirrhosis, cancers. Uh, liver cancer, etc. cetera. Uh, it can be um, damage to the alveolus capilla capillary barrier, um, such as seen um, in ARDS, uh, that you get pulmonary edema in ARDS uh, because of the damage and inflammation in that pulmonary, pulmonary capillary barrier that causes inflammation and swelling in fluids around the lung. 
Uh, high altitude and renal failure can also cause pulmonary edema. The lab tests that are relevant for this is going to be an, uh, due to ABG, obviously. The lower the PO2, the more severe the edema is because you just cannot, the oxygen cannot get into that blood. Uh, and it's good to do a BUN creatinine for renal status since renal failure can be a cause. Okay, so liver failure can cause pulmonary edema. Is that a yes or no? Answer that. If you're not sure, just rewind it a little bit. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about pulmonary hypertension. Um, so it's an elevated pulmonary artery pressure, um, and it le can lead to a right-sided heart failure, and it's often due to vascular resistance. Uh, so what the heck does uh, all that mean? So if you uh, go back with me here to the heart, so um, blood is returning from the body to the right side of the heart, through the right atria, to the right ventricle and it's pump, the right ventricle pumps it through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs to pick up oxygen. Okay, so the problem is if there is, for example, let's say in emphysema, a um, reduction of the surface area of the alveoli and a reduction in the capillary bed, there are less capillaries around the lungs, meaning there is less space for the blood that you pump to fill. Okay, meaning it's going to be harder for the right side of the heart to push the blood to the lungs because there's more resistance, and that's vascular resistance, um, because there's not enough space for all the blood to, to, to go around in all the lungs because there's damage, and the capillaries have been damaged. Okay, and so this constant having to force that blood to the lungs is causing hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, and it can cause the right side of the heart to start failing, this, this uh, wall to become thickened, and it can even become more ine inefficient of a pump. So uh, it's very rare to have this as a primary disease, um, but a, as a secondary disease, it can be secondary to COPD, obviously loss of surface area, uh, to heart disease um, that can be you know, causing, uh, again, the uh, vascular resistance, we can have a plaque accumulation in, in these arteries there. Uh, collagen vascular disease and rec recurrent thromboemboli. So if you have a clot that's blocking a passageway, it's the same thing, but it keeps happening, right? It's harder for that right side of the heart to be pushing the blood here because it's blocked by a clot. Lab tests for pulmonary hypertension are going to be the ABG to check for hypoxemia, and again, tests for these underlying causes um, is what they'll have to do also. Atelectasis is partial lung collapse. So if you want to picture in your mind, a picture like a deflated balloon. I don't know if you've ever played with balloons as a kid, and you've like inflated and deflated and deflated, and maybe even make it make funny little sounds and stuff. Um, after you've inflated and deflated that balloon several times, it gets to where it just sticks and it's harder to reinflate it. And so this collapsed sticky balloon is deflated. It's a good representation of atelectasis if you imagine that that's an alveoli, okay? And then it happens to several of the alveoli. Uh, and so, um, and, um, so this, if this happens in an entire lung, you can have a total collapse of the entire lung. Uh, there are several types of atelectasis. There's resorption atelectasis, so there's a bronchial obstruction that will block the air from entering that lungs, uh, and of course then the gas in the alveoli is stuck, it can't move because the passage is blocked, and so it will be resorbed into the blood, which would then means it leaves the alveoli and it causes the alveoli to deflate. Um, this is really common after surgery due to anesthesia, and it's common with asthma, bronchitis, and tumors. Um, and this is going to be why, for example, after surgery, after anesthesia, our respiratory therapists come around and have patients like forcibly blow into uh, this um, it's incentive spirometry is what they call it. Um, so so it, it makes like force this air movement in the lungs is that so one, you don't get this, and two, you don't develop pneumonia. You can, uh, they can get com compression atelectasis, so the lungs are compressed due to upward pressure on the diaphragm. So uh, and this is because there's excess fluid in, or excess blood in the abdomen. So the abdomen is swelling and therefore it's pushing up on the diaphragm and therefore compressing the lungs. 
Um, you can get contraction atelectasis is due to the contraction of scars in the lungs. We know that scar tissue doesn't allow gas exchange, but also doesn't allow expansion. Scar tissue doesn't move very well. Uh, and so wherever there's scars, it's going to pull back. It's going to contract those, those areas. Um, right middle lobe syndrome can be caused by a bronchus obstruction also. And then um, there's very little in laboratory involvement with these conditions. Uh, it's totally the world of respiratory therapist. Pulmonary embolism. Um, so um, due to a moving embolus, an embolus is a clot that has dislodged itself and is traveling through the venous system and into the arterial system. So it is usually a complication of a venous thrombosis, meaning a blood clot in the vein, uh, especially DVT, deep vein thrombosis. So the bigger veins in the legs tend to be uh, a quite um, common cause of DVT. Uh, and so a part of the clot breaks off from the leg and it travels through those um, you know, the major veins and that's okay. And it reaches the heart and then it gets pumped and it goes to where does the heart pump to, to the lungs. But then the, the arteries of, um, of the pulmonary arteries are going to become increasingly smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And so that clot eventually is going to get lodged um, in an artery. So uh, causes of venous, venous thrombosis are going to be major surgery, trauma, infections, congestive heart failure, pregnancy, birth control pills, prolonged bed rest, metastatic cancer, so there are many more causes. The symptoms are going to be chest pain, difficulty breathing, and if it's a large uh, emboli, it can die immediately. It's, it, that can be really, I mean, like, it's very hard to save the patients that have that. Um, if they're smaller emboli and we can detect them, um, there is um, spiral CT, I believe, and or VQ imaging or something like that, or some of the imagings that have to be done um, by our imaging departments to, to find these uh, pulmonary embolisms. But in the lab, we can do a D-dimer, uh, and that is the you know, degradation products of clots that are present, and we can detect. It doesn't tell you where the clot is, but it could say that there has been a clotting process going on, and so this can be useful for pulmonary embolism. It's pretty much the only lab test that's useful for pulmonary embolism. And so I'm going to link this video below to you on pulmonary embolism. And then we are going to talk about pleural effusion. So this is fluid in the pleural cavity. The pleural cavity as portrayed here is, is the cavity that your lungs sit in. So you have two uh, membranes. You have the pleural membrane that um, lines uh, the, the lungs. And then you have the parietal pleura that lines the lung cavity. And then there's fluid in between the two. And this is because when you breathe in and breathe out, like it, one, it needs to pull the lungs open. But uh, there's also friction that happens. And the fluid ha uh, helps the, the friction, uh, keep the friction down. So a smooth movement of the lungs is to inflate, deflate, inflate, deflate. Okay. And so um, this pleural effusion, this uh, uh, accumulation of fluid in this pleural space could be a transudate or an exudate. So transudates are clear and pale yellow, and transudates will always have like a mechanical cause. So something like a congestive heart failure or something like that. There's, there's something mechanically going on. And exudates should be analyzed by the lab, and um, they're usually are going to be cloudier, pussier, and um, you need to analyze them for um, looking for uh, pathogens, so um, very commonly do cultures, um, or do um, uh, cytology on it to look for malignant neoplasm, cancer cells, etc. So cancers, infections, etc. tend to cause transudates, uh, I'm sorry, uh, exudates, transudates are caused by mechanical uh, issues. So pump issues, uh, fluid imbalance issues, et cetera. So um, if um, an exudate would be caused, for example, by an empyema, which would um, cause pus, could be caused by hemothorax, which then you would have blood in uh, the pleural fluid, could be chylothorax, which is obstruction of or damage to the lymphatic system that's causing the fluid accumulation. So if you have a milky appearing pleural fluid, it's indicative of cow. 
Calothorax is going to be caused by an obstruction or damage of the lymphatic system, just said, and then triglycerides are elevated also in callous effusion. So we get it tested for all this stuff. Tested for blood, tested for pus, tested for um, cow by looking for triglycerides. And so um, if the fluid serum protein ratio is greater than 0 0.5 or the fluid serum LDH is, ratio is greater than 0 0.6, then the fluid is an exudate. And so just the way you do that is you measure the protein level in the fluid, measure the protein level in the serum, and compare. Same thing with LDH. Um, and so you can get information there to decide if this is an exudate or transudate. Little matchy, matchy um, activity there. And then this is your last slide. So if you have any questions, let me know. You can drop them below in your comments if you're on YouTube, or you can drop it in Neopod if you're in my class. All right, thank you for your attention.